towards it. The Argonath, the pillars of the kings, cried Aragorn. Keep the boats in line and as far apart as you can. Hold the middle of the stream. As Frodo was borne towards them, the great pillars rose like towers to meet them. Giants they seemed to him, vast grey figures, silent but threatening. Then he saw that they were indeed shaped and fashioned. The craft and power of old had wrought upon them, and still they preserved through the suns and rains of forgotten years the mighty likenesses in which they had been hewn. Upon great pedestals founded in the deep waters stood two great kings of stone. Still with blurred eyes and crannied brows they frowned upon the north. The left hand of each was raised palm outwards in gesture of warning. In each bright hand there was an axe. Upon each head there was a crumbling helm and crown. Great power and majesty they still wore. The silent wardens of a long vanished kingdom. Awe and fear fell upon Frodo, and he covered down, shutting his eyes, and not daring to look up as the boat drew near. Even Boromir bowed his head as the boats whirled by, frail and fleeting as little leaves, under the enduring shadow of the sentinels of Numenor. So they passed into the dark chasm of the gates. She arose the dreadful cliffs to unguessed heights on either side. Far off was the dim sky. The black waters roared and echoed, and a wind screamed over them. Frodo, crouching over his knees, heard Sam in front, muttering and groaning. Oh, what a place! What a horrible place! Just let me get out of this door and I'll never wrap my toes in a pool again, let alone a river. Fear not! said a strange voice behind him. Frodo turned and saw Strider, and yet not Strider, for the weather-worn ranger was no longer there. In the stern sat Aragorn, son of Erathorn, proud and erect, guiding the boat with skillful strokes. His hood was cast back, and his dark hair was blowing in the wind. A light was in his eyes, a king returning from exile to his own land. Fear not, he said. Long have I desired to look upon the likenesses of Isildur and Anarion, my sires of old. Under their shadow, Elessar the Elfstone, son of Erathorn of the house of Valendil, Isildur's son, heir of Elendil, has naught to dread. The light of his eyes faded and he spoke to himself. Would that candle were here. How my heart yearns for Minas Anor and the walls of my own city. Then now shall I go? The chasm was long and dark, and filled with the noise of wind and rushing water and echoing stone. It bent somewhat towards the west, so that at first all was dark ahead. But soon Frodo saw a tall gap of light before him, ever growing. Swiftly it drew near, and suddenly the boats shot through, out into a wide, clear light. The sun, already long fallen from the noon, was shining in the windy sky. The spent water spread out into a long oval lake, pale Nenhithoel, fenced by steep grey hills whose sides were clad with trees. But their heads were bare, cold gleaming in the sunlight. At the far southern end rose three peaks. The midmost stood somewhat forward from the others and sundered from them, an island in the waters, about which the flowing river flung pale shimmering arms. Distant but deep there came up on the wind a roaring sound like the roll of thunder heard far away. Behold tall Brandir, said Aragorn, pointing south to the tall peak. Upon the left stands Amon Hlor, and upon the right is Amon Hen, the hills of hearing and of sight. In the days of the great kings there were high seats upon them, and watch was kept there. But it is said that no foot of man or beast has ever been set upon Tol Brandir. Ere the shade of night falls, we shall come to them. I hear the endless voice of Rauros calling. The company rested now for a while, drifting south on the current that flowed through the middle of the lake. They ate some food, and then they took to their paddles and hastened on their way. The sides of the westward hills fell into shadow, and the sun grew round and red. 
Here and there a misty star peered out. The three peaks loomed before them, darkling in the twilight. Rauros was roaring with a great voice. Already night was laid on the flowing waters. When the travelers came at last under the shadow of the hills. The tenth day of their journey was over. Wilderland was behind them. They could go no further without choice between the east way and the west. The last stage of the quest was before them. Aragorn led them to the right arm of the river. Here upon its western side under the shadow of Tol Grandir, a green lawn ran down to the water from the feet of Amon Hen. Behind it rose the first gentle slopes of the hill clad with trees, and trees marched away westward along the curving shores of the lake. A little spring fell tumbling down and fed the grass. Here we will rest tonight, said Aragorn. This is the lawn of Parth Galen, a fair place in the summer days of old. Let us hope that no evil has yet come here. They drew up their boats on the green banks, and beside them they made their camp. They set a watch, but had no sight nor sound of their enemies. If Gollum had contrived to follow them, he remained unseen and unheard. Nonetheless, as the night wore on, Aragorn grew uneasy, tossing often in his sleep and waking. In the small hours he got up and came to Frodo, whose turn it was to watch. Asked Frodo. I do not know, answered Aragorn. But a shadow and a threat has been growing in my sleep. It would be well to draw your sword. Why? said Frodo. Let us see what sting may show, answered Aragorn. Frodo then drew the elf blade from his sheath. To his dismay, the edges gleamed dimly in the night. Oaks, he said. N not very near, but and yet too near, it seems. I feared as much, said Aragorn, but maybe they are not on this side of the river. The light of Sting is faint, and it may point to no more than spies of Mordor roaming on the slopes of Ammon Law. I have never heard before of orcs upon Ammon Hen. Yet who knows what may happen in these evil days, now that Minas Tirith no longer holds secure the passages of Anduin. We must go warily tomorrow. The day came like fire and smoke. Low in the east there were black bars of cloud like the fumes of great burning. The rising sun lit them from beneath with flames of murky red, but soon it climbed above them into a clear sky. The summit of Tolbrandir was tipped with gold. Frodo looked out eastward and gazed at the tall island. Its sides sprang sheer out of the running water. High above the tall cliffs were steep slopes upon which trees climbed, mounting one head above another. And above them again were grey faces of inaccessible rock, crowned by a great spire of stone. Many birds were circling about it, but no sign of other living things could be seen. When they had eaten, Aragorn called the company together. The day has come at last, he said. The day of choice, which we have long delayed. What shall now become of our company that has travelled so far in fellowship? Shall we turn west with Boromir and go to the walls of Gondor? Or turn east to the fear and shadow? Or shall we break our fellowship and go this way and that as each may choose? Whatever we do must be done soon. We cannot long halt here. The enemy is on the eastern shore, we know. But I fear that the orcs may already be on this side of the water. There was a long silence in which no one spoke or moved. Well, Frodo, said Aragorn at last, I fear that the burden is laid upon you. You are the bearer appointed by the council. Your own way you alone can choose. In this matter I cannot advise you. I am not Gandalf, and though I have tried to bear his part, 
I do not know what design or hope he had for this hour, if indeed he had any. Most likely it seems that if he were here now, the choice would still wait upon you. Such is your fate. Frodo did not answer at once. Then he spoke slowly. I know that haste is needed, yet I cannot choose. The burden is heavy. Give me an hour longer, and I will speak. Let me be alone. Aragorn looked at him with kindly pity. Very well, Frodo, son of Drogo, he said. You shall have an hour, and you shall be alone. We will stay here for a while, but do not stray far or out of call. Frodo sat for a moment with his head bowed. Sam, who had been watching his master with great concern, shook his head and muttered. Plain as a pikestaff it is, but it's no good, Sam Gamgee, putting in his smoke just now. Presently Frodo got up and walked away, and Sam saw that while the others restrained themselves and did not stare at him, the eyes of Boromir followed Frodo intently, until he passed out of sight in the trees at the foot of Amon Hen. Wandering aimlessly at first in the wood, Frodo found that his feet were leading him up towards the slopes of the hill. He came to a path, the dwindling ruins of a road long ago. In steep places, stairs of stone had been hewn, but now they were cracked and worn, and split by the roots of trees. Until he came to a grassy place. Rowan trees grew about it, and in the midst was a wide flat stone. The little upland lawn was open upon the east and was filled now with the early sunlight. Frodo halted and looked over the river. Far below him, Tol Brandir and the birds wheeling in the great gulf of air between him and the unstrodden isle. The voice of Rauros was a mighty roaring mingled with a deep throbbing boom. He sat down upon the stone and cupped his chin in his hands, staring eastward but seeing little with his eyes. All that had happened since Bilbo left the Shire was passing through his mind, and he recalled and pondered everything that he could remember of Gandalf's words. Time went on, and still he was no nearer to a choice. Suddenly he awoke from his thoughts. A strange feeling came to him that something was behind him, that unfriendly eyes were upon him. He sprang up and turned, but all that he saw to his surprise was Boromir and his face was smiling and kind. For you, Frodo, he said, coming forward. If Aragorn is right, then orcs are near, then none of us should wander alone, and you least of all. So much depends on you. And my heart is too heavy. May I stay now and talk for a while, since I have found you? It would comfort me. There are so many, all speech becomes a debate without end. But two together may perhaps find wisdom. You are kind, answered Frodo, but I do not think that any speech will help me, for I know what I should do. But I am afraid of doing it, Boromir. Afraid. Boromir stood silent. Raros roared endlessly on. The wind murmured in the branches of the trees. Frodo shivered. Suddenly Boromir came and sat behind him. Are you sure that you do not suffer needlessly? He said. I wish to help you. You need counsel in your hard choice. Will you not take mine? I think I know already what counsel you would give, Boromir, said Frodo. And it would seem like wisdom but for the warning in my heart. Warning? Warning against what? Said Boromir sharply. Against delay. Against the way that seems easier. Against refusal of the burden that is still laid on me. Against... Well, if it must be said, against trust in the strength and truth of men. Yet that strength has long protected you far away in your little country, though you knew it not. I do not doubt the valor of your people, but the world is changing. The walls of Minas Tirith may be strong, but they are not strong enough. If they fail, what then? We shall fall in battle valiantly. Yet there is still hope that they will not fail. 
No hope while the ring lasts, said Frodo. Ah, the ring, said Boromir, his eyes lighting. The ring! Is it not a strange fate that we should suffer so much fear and doubt for so small a thing? So small a thing. And I have seen it only in an instant in the house of Elrond. Could I not have a sight of it again? Frodo looked up. His heart went suddenly cold. He caught the strange gleam in Boromir's eyes, yet his face was still kind and friendly. It is best that it should lie hidden, he answered. As you wish. I cannot, said Boromir. Yet may I not even speak of it, for you seem ever to think only of its power in the hands of the enemy, of its evil uses, not of its good. The world is changing, you say. Minas Tirith will fall if the ring lasts. But why? Certainly if the ring were with the enemy, but why if it were with us? We are not at the council, answered Frodo. Because we cannot use it, and what is done with it tends to evil. Boromir got up and walked about impatiently. So you go on, he cried. Gandalf, Elrond, all these folk have taught you to say so. For themselves they may be right. These elves and half-elves and wizards, they would come to grief, perhaps. Yet often I doubt if they are wise and not merely timid, but each to his own kind. True-hearted men, they will not be corrupted. We of Minas Tirith have been staunch through long years of trial. We do not despise the power of wizard lords, only the strength to defend ourselves. Strength in a just cause. And behold, in our need, chance brings to light the ring of power. It is a gift, I say, a gift to the foes of Mordor. It is mad not to use it, to use the power of the enemy against him. The fearless, the ruthless, these alone will achieve victory. What could not a warrior do in this hour? A great leader! What could not Aragorn do? Or if he refuses, why not Boromir? The ring would give me power of command. Oh, how I would drive the hosts of Mordor! Men would flock to my banner! Boromir strode up and down, speaking ever more loudly. Almost he seemed to have forgotten Frodo, while his talk dwelt on walls and weapons, and the mustering of men, and he drew plans of great alliances and glorious victories to be. And he cast down Mordor, and became himself a mighty king, benevolent and wise. Suddenly he stopped and waved his arms. And they tell us to throw it away, he cried. I do not say destroy it. That might be well if reason could show any hope of doing so. It does not. The only plan that is proposed to us is that the halfling should walk blindly into Mordor and offer the enemy every chance of recapturing it for himself. Folly! Surely you see it, my friend. He said, turning now suddenly to Frodo again. You say you are afraid. If it is so, the boldest should pardon you. But is it not really your good sense that revolts? No, no, I am afraid, said Frodo. Simply afraid. But I am glad to have heard you speak so fully. My mind is clearer now. Then you will come to Minas Tirith, cried Boromir. His eyes were shining and his face eager. You misunderstand me, said Frodo. But you will come, uh, at least for a while, Boromir persisted. Uh, my city is not far now, and it is little further from there to Mordor than from here. We have been long in the wilderness, and you need news of what the enemy is doing before you make a move. Come with me, Frodo, he said. You need rest before your venture, if go you must. He laid his hand on the hobbit's shoulder in friendly fashion, but Frodo felt a hand trembling with suppressed excitement. He stepped quickly away and eyed with alarm the tall man, nearly twice his height and many times his match in strength. Why are you so unfriendly? said Boromir. I am a true man, neither thief nor tracker. I need your ring, that you know now. But I give you my word that I do not desire to keep it. Will you not at least let me make trial of my plan? Lend me the ring. No, no cried Frodo. The council laid it upon me to bear it. It is by your own folly that the enemy will defeat us, cried Boromir. How it angers me! Fool! Obstinate fool! Running willfully to death and ruining our cause! If any mortals have claimed to the ring, it is the men of Numenor and not halflings. 
by unhappy chance. It might have been mine. It should have been mine. Give it to me. Rhoda did not answer, but moved away till the great flat stone stood between them. Come, come, my friend, said Boromir in a softer voice. Why not get rid of it? Why not be free of your doubt and fear? You can lay the blame on me if you will. You can say that I was too strong and took it by force. For I am too strong for you, halfling! He cried. And suddenly he sprang over the stone and leaped at Frodo. His fair and pleasant face was hideously changed. A raging fire was in his eyes. Frodo dodged aside and again and put the stone between them. There was only one thing he could do. Trembling, he put out the ring upon its chain and quickly slipped it on his finger. Even as Boromir sprang at him again, the man gasped, stared for a moment amazed, and then ran wildly about, seeking here and there among the rocks and trees. Miserable trickster! He shouted. Let me get my hands on you! Now I see your mind! You will take the ring to Sauron and sell us all! You've only waited for your chance to leave us in the lurch! Curse you! Curse you! All the halflings to death and darkness! Then, catching his foot on a stone, he fell sprawling and lay upon his face. For a while he was still, as if his own curse had struck him down. Then suddenly he wept. He rose and passed his hand over his eyes, dashing away the tears. What have I said? What have I said? He cried. What have I done? Frodo! Frodo! He called. Come back! Come back! A madness took me, but it has passed. Come back! Come back! There was no answer. Frodo. Frodo did not even hear his cries. He was already far away, leaping blindly up the path to the hilltop. Terror and grief shook him, seeing in his thought the mad, fierce face of Boromir and his burning eyes. Soon he came out alone on the summit of Amon Hen, and halted, gasping for breath. He saw as through a mist, a wide flat circle paved with mighty flags and surrounded with a crumbling battlement, and in the middle set upon four carven pillars was a high seat, reached by a stair of many steps. Up he went and sat upon the ancient chair, feeling like a lost child that had clambered upon the throne of mountain kings. At first he could see little. He seemed to be in a world of mist in which there were only shadows. The ring was upon him. Then here and there the mists gave way and he saw many visions, small and clear as if they were under his eyes upon a table, and yet remote. There was no sound, only bright living images. The world seemed to have shrunk and fallen silent. He was sitting upon the seat of seeing, on Amon Hen, the hill of the eye of the men of Numenor. Eastward he looked into wide uncharted lands, nameless plains and forests unexplored. Northward he looked and the great river lay like a ribbon beneath him, and the misty mountains stood small and hard as broken teeth. Westward he looked and saw the broad pastures of Rohan, in Orthanc, the pinnacle of Isengard like a black spike. Southward he looked, and below his very feet the great river curled like a topping wave and plunged over the falls of Rauros into a foaming pit. A glimmering rainbow played upon the fume. And Ethir Anduin he saw, the mighty delta of the river, and pyramids of seabirds whirling like a white dust in the sun, and beneath them a green and silver sea, rippling in endless lines. But everywhere he looked he saw the signs of war. The misty mountains were crawling like anthills. Orcs were issuing out of a thousand holes. Under the boughs of Beerquid there was deadly strife of elves and men and fell beasts. The land of the Beornings was aflame. A cloud was over Moria. Smoke rose on the borders of Lorien. Horsemen were galloping on the grass of Rohan. Wolves poured from Isengard. From the havens of Harad, ships of war put out to sea, and out of the east men were moving endlessly. Swordsmen, spearmen, bowmen upon horses, chariots of chieftains in laden wains. All the power of the Dark Lord was in motion. Then turning south again, he beheld Minas Tirith. Far away, it seemed, and beautiful, white-walled, many-towered, proud and fair upon its mountain seat, its battlements glittered with steel, and its turrets were bright with many banners. Hope leaped in his heart, but against Minas Tirith was set another fortress, greater, 
and more strong. Thither, eastward, unwilling his eye was drawn, it passed the ruined bridges of Asgiliath, the grinning gates of Minas Morgul, and the haunted mountains, and it looked upon Gorgoroth, the valley of terror and the land of Mordor. Darkness lay there under the sun, fire glowed amid the smoke, Mount Doom was burning, and a great reek rising. Then at last his gaze was held, wall upon wall, battlement upon battlement, black, immeasurably strong, mountain of iron, gate of steel, tower of adamant. He saw it, Varadur, fortress of Sauron. All hope left him. And suddenly he felt the eye. There was an eye in the dark tower that did not sleep. He knew that it had become aware of his gaze. A fierce, eager will was there. It leaped towards him, almost like a finger he felt it, searching for him. Very soon it would nail him down, know just exactly where he was. Amenhlaw it touched. It glanced upon Tolbrandir. He threw himself from the seat, crouching, covering his head with his grey hood. He heard himself crying out. Never! Never! Or was it? Verily! Verily I come to you! He could not tell. Then, as a flash from some other point of power, there came to his mind another thought. The two powers strove in him. For a moment perfectly balanced between their piercing points, he writhed, tormented. Suddenly he was aware of himself again. Frodo, neither the voice nor the eye, free to choose, and with one remaining instant in which to do so, he took the ring off his finger. He was kneeling in clear sunlight before the high seat. A black shadow seemed to pass like an arm above him. It missed Amon Hen and groped out west, and faded. Then all the sky was clean and blue, and birds sang in every tree. Frodo rose to his feet. A great weariness was on him, but his will was firm, and his heart lighter. He spoke aloud to himself. (sighs) I will do now what I must, he said. This at least is plain. The evil of the ring is already at work, even in the company, and the ring must leave them before it does more harm. I will go alone. Some I cannot trust, and those I can trust are too dear to me. Poor old Sam, and Mary, and Pippin, Strider too. His heart yearns for Minas Tirith, and he will be needed there. Now Boromir has fallen into evil. I will go alone. At once. He went quickly down the path and came back to the lawn where Boromir had found him. Then he halted, listening. He thought he could hear cries and calls from the woods near the shore below. They'll be hunting for me, he said. I wonder how long I have been away. Hours, I should think. He hesitated. What can I do? He muttered. I must go now or I shall never go. I shan't get a chance again. I hate leaving them and like this without an explanation. But surely they will understand. Sam will. And what else can I do? Slowly he drew out the ring and put it on once more. He vanished and passed down the hill, less than a rustle of the wind. The others remained long by the riverside. For some time they had been silent, moving restlessly about, but now they were sitting in a circle, and they were talking. Every now and again they made efforts to speak of other things, of their long road and many adventures. They questioned Aragorn concerning the realm of Gondor and its ancient history, and the remnants of its great works that could still be seen in this strange borderland of the Emin Muil. The stone kings in the seats of Hlor and Hen and the great stair beside the falls of Rauros. But always their thoughts and words strayed back to Frodo and the ring. What would Frodo choose to do? Why was he hesitating? 
"'He is debating which course is the most desperate, I think,' said Aragorn. "'And well he may. "'It is now more hopeless than ever for the company to go east, "'since we have been tracked by Gollum, "'and must fear that the secret of our journey is already betrayed. "'But Minas Tirith is no nearer to the fire and the destruction of the burden. "'We may remain there for a while and make a brave stand, "'but the Lord Denethor and all his men cannot hope to do "'what even Elrond said was beyond his power.' either to keep the burden secret, or to hold off the full might of the enemy when he comes to take it. Which way would any of us choose in Frodo's place? I do not know. Now indeed we miss Gandalf most. Grievous is our loss, said Legolas. Yet we must needs make up our minds without his aid. Why cannot we decide and so help Frodo? Let us call him back and then vote. I should vote for Minas Tirith. And so should I, said Gimli. We, of course, were only sent to help the bearer along the road, and go no further than we wished. And none of us is under any oath or command to seek Mount Doom. Hard was my parting from Lord Lorien. Yet I have come so far, and I say this. Now we have reached the last choice. It is clear to me that I cannot leave Frodo. I would choose Minas Tirith, but if he does not, then I follow him. Two will go with him, said Legolas. It would be faithless now to say farewell. It would indeed be a betrayal if we all left him, said Aragorn. But if he goes east, then all need not go with him. Nor do I think that all should. That venture is desperate. As much so for eight as for three or two, or one alone. If you would let me choose, then I should appoint three companions. Sam, who would not bear it otherwise, and Gimli and myself. Boromir will return to his own city, where his father and his people need him, and with him the others should go, or at least Meriadoc and Peregrine, if Legolas is not willing to leave us. That won't do it all, cried Merry. We can't leave Frodo. Pippin and I have always intended to go wherever he went, and we still do. But we did not realize what that would mean. It seemed different so far away in the Shire or in Riverdale. It would be bad and cruel to let Frodo go to Mordor. Why can't we stop him? We must stop him! said Pippin. And that is why he's worrying about, I'm sure. He knows we shan't agree to his going east. He doesn't like to ask anyone to go with him. Imagine it. Going off to Mordor. Alone. Pippin shuddered. What the dear serial hobbit. He ought to know that he hasn't got to ask. We ought to know that if we can't stop him, we shan't leave him. Begging your pardon, said Sam. I don't think you understand my master at all. He isn't hesitating about which way to go. Of course not. What's the good of Minas Tirith anyway? Uh, uh, to him. Begging your pardon, Master Boromir. He added and turned. It was then that they discovered that Boromir, who at first had been sitting silent on the outside of the circle, was no longer there. Now where's he got to? cried Sam, looking worried. He's been a bit queer lately, to my mind. But anyway, he's not in this business. He's off to his home, as he always said, and no blame to him. But Mr. Frodo, he knows he's got to find the cracks of doom, if he can. But he's afraid. Now it's come to the point he's just plain terrified. That's what his trouble is. Of course, he's had a bit of schooling, so to speak. We all have, since we left home. Or he'd be so terrified they'd just fling the ring in the river and bolt. But he's still too frightened to start. And he isn't worried about us, either. Whether we'll be going with him or no, he knows we mean to. That's another thing that's bothering him. If he screws himself up to go, he'll want to go alone, mark my words. We're going to have trouble when he comes back, for he'll screw himself up all right, as sure as his name's Baggins. I believe you speak more wisely than any of us, Sam, said Aragorn. And what shall we do if you prove right? Stop him! Don't let him go, cried Pippin. I wonder, said Aragorn. He is the bearer, and the fate of the burden is on him. I do not think that it is our part to drive him one way or the other, nor do I think that we should succeed if we tried. There are other powers at work, far stronger. Said Pippin. This waiting is horrible. Surely the time is up. Yes, said Aragorn. The hour is long past. The morning is wearing away. We must call for him. 
At that moment, Boromir reappeared. He came out from the trees and walked towards them without speaking. His face looked grim and sad. He paused as if counting those that were present, and then sat down aloof, with his eyes on the ground. Where have you been, Boromir? asked Aragorn. Have you seen Frodo? Boromir hesitated for a second. Yes. And no. He answered slowly. Yes, I found him some way up the hill and I spoke to him. I urged him to come to Minas Tirith and not go east. I grew angry. And he left me. He vanished. I have never seen such a thing happen before, though I have heard of it in tales. He must have put the ring on. I could not find him again. I thought he would return to you. Is that all you have to say? Said Aragorn, looking hard and not too kindly at Boromir. Yes, he answered. <gasps> oh, this is bad, cried Sam, jumping up. I don't know what this man has been up to. Why should Mr. Frodo put the thing on? He didn't ought to have, and if he has, goodness knows what might have happened. But he wouldn't keep it on, said Mary. Not when he escaped the unwelcome visitor like Bilbo used to. Cried Pippin. How long is it since you saw Frodo last, Boromir? Answered Aragorn. He answered. He put his head in his hands, and he sat as if bowed with grief. Shouted Sam. Wait a moment! cried Aragorn. We must divide up into pairs and arrange... Uh, here! Hold on! Wait! It was no good. They took no notice of him. Sam had dashed off first. Merry and Pippin had followed, and were already disappearing westward into the trees by the shore, shouting, Frodo! Frodo! In their clear, high hobbit voices, Legolas and Gimli were running. A sudden panic or madness seemed to have fallen on the company. We shall be scattered and lost, groaned Aragorn. Boromir, I do not know what part you have played in all this mischief, but help now. Go after those two young hobbits and guard them at the least, even if you cannot find Frodo. Come back to this spot if you find him, or any traces of him. I shall return soon. Aragorn sprang swiftly away and went in pursuit of Sam. Just as he reached the little lawn among the rowans, he overtook him, toiling uphill, panting and calling. Frodo! Come with me, Sam, he said. I'm going to the top to the seat of Amonhen to see what may be seen. And look, it is as my heart guessed. Frodo went this way. He sped up the path. Sam did his best, but he could not keep up with Strider the ranger, and soon fell behind. He had not gone far before Aragorn was out of sight ahead. Sam stopped and puffed. Suddenly he clapped his hand to his head. Whoa! Whoa, Sam Yamji, he said aloud. Your legs are too short, but use your head. Let me see now. Moromir isn't lying. That's not his way. But he hasn't told us everything. Something scared Mr. Frodo badly. He screwed himself up to the point sudden. He made up his mind at last. To go. Where to? Her face. Not without Sam. Yes. Yes, without even his Sam. Oh, that's hard. Cruel hard. Sam passed his hand over his eyes, brushing away the tears. Steady, Gamji, he said. Think if you can. He can't fly across... He can't fly across rivers. He can't trap waterfalls. He's got no gear. He's... So he's got to get back to the boats. Back to the boats. Back to the boats, Sam. Like, like... Sam turned and bolted back down the path. He fell and cut his knees. Up he got and ran on. He came to the edge of the lawn of Path Garland by the shore, where the boats were drawn up out of the water. No one was there. There seemed to be cries in the woods behind, but he did not heed them. He stood gazing for a moment, rock still, gaping. A boat was sliding down the bank all by itself. With a shout, Sam raced across the grass. The boat slipped into the water, Coming, Mr. Frodo! Coming! 
cold Sam and flung himself from the bank, clutching at the departing boat. He missed it by a yard. With a cry and a splash, he fell face downward into deep swift water. Gurgling, he went under, and the river closed over his curly head. An exclamation of dismay came from the empty boat. A panel swelled and the boat put about. Frodo was just in time to grasp Sam by the hair as he came up, bubbling and struggling. Fear was staring in his round brown eyes. Have you come, Sam, my lad? said Frodo. Now, take my hand. Say, we must not... Oh, oh. oh laughed Sam. <laughs> I'm drowning, Frodo. I can't say you have. Here it is. Don't pitch, lad. I won't let you go. Tread water and don't flounder over the rest of the boat. There now. Go to the side. Let me use the paddle. With a few strokes, Frodo brought the boat back to the bank, and Sam was able to scramble out, wet as a water rat. Frodo took off the ring and stepped ashore again. Of all the confounded nuisances, you are the worst, Sam, he said. Oh, oh Mr. Frodo, that's hard, said Sam, shivering. That's hard. Trying to go without me, you know. If I hadn't a guest right, where would you be now? Safely on my way. Safely, said Sam. Oh, all alone and without me to help you? I couldn't have borne it. It'd have to be the death of me. It would be death of you to come with me, Sam, said Frodo. <coughs> and I could not have borne that. Not in certain as being left behind, said Sam. But I am going to Mordor. I know that well enough, Mr. Frodo. Of course you are. And I'm coming with you. Now, Sam, said Frodo, don't hinder me. The others will be coming back any minute. If they catch me here, I shall have to argue and explain, and I shall never have the heart or the chance to get off. But I must go at once. It's the only way. Of course it is, answered Sam. I'm not alone. I'm coming too, or neither of us isn't going. I'll knock holes at all the boats for... Frodo actually laughed. A sudden warmth and gladness touched his heart. Leave one, he said. We'll need it. But you can't come like this without your gear or food or anything. Oh. Cried Sam eagerly. It's all ready. He rushed to the camping place, fished out his pack from the pile where Frodo had laid it when he emptied the boat of his companion's goods, grabbed a spare blanket and some extra packages of food, and ran back. <laughs> said Frodo. It's, it's no good trying to escape you. But I'm glad, Sam. I cannot tell you how glad. Come along. It is plain that we were meant to go together. We will go. And may the others find a safer road. Strider will look after them. I don't suppose we shall see them again. We may, yeah, Mr. Frodo. We may, said Sam. So Frodo and Sam set off on the last stage of the quest together. Frodo paddled away from the shore, and the river bore them swiftly away, down the western arm, and past the frowning cliffs of Tol Brandir. The roar of the great falls drew nearer. Even with such help as Sam could give, it was hard work to pass across the current at the southward end of the island, and drive the boat eastward towards the far shore. At length they came to land again upon the southern slopes of Amonhlaw. There they found a shelving shore, and they drew the boat out, high above the water, and hid it as well as they could behind the great boulder. Then, shouldering their burdens, they set off, seeking a path that would bring them over the grey hills of the Emin Wheel, and down into the land of shadow.
The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien Part 2 The Two Towers Aragorn sped on up the hill. Every now and again he bent to the ground. Hobbits go light, and their footprints are not easy even for a ranger to read. But not far from the top a spring crossed the path, and in the wet earth he saw what he was seeking. I read the signs right, he said to himself. Frodo ran to the hilltop. I wonder what he saw there. But he returned by the same way, and he went down the hill again. Aragorn hesitated. He desired to go to the high seat himself, hoping to see there something that would guide him in his perplexities. But time was pressing. Suddenly he leaped forward and ran to the summit, across the great flagstones, and up the steps. Then, sitting in the high seat, he looked out. But the sun seemed darkened, and the world dim and remote. He turned from the north, back again to north, and saw nothing, save the distant hills, unless it were that far away he could see again a great bird like an eagle high in the air, descending slowly in wide circles down towards the earth. Even as he gazed, his quick ears caught sounds in the woodlands below, on the west side of the river. He stiffened. There were cries, and among them to his horror he could distinguish the harsh voices of orcs. Then suddenly, with a deep-throated call, a great horn blew, and the blasts of it smote the hills and echoed in the hollows, rising in a mighty shout above the roaring of the falls. The horn of Boromir! he cried. Sinead! He sprang down the steps and away, leaping down the path. Alas, an ill fate on this day, but all that I do goes amiss! Where is Sam? As he ran, the cries came louder, but fainter now, and desperately the horn was blown. Fierce and shrill rose the yells of the orcs, and suddenly the horn grew ceased. Aragorn raced down the last slope, but before he could reach the hill's foot, the sounds died away, and as he turned to the left and ran towards them, they retreated, until at last he could hear them no more. Drawing his bright sword and crying, he crashed through the trees. A mile, maybe, from Path Garlin, in a little glade not far from the lake, he found Boromir. He was sitting with his back to a great tree, as if he was resting. But Aragorn saw that he was pierced with many black feathered arrows. His sword was still in his hand, but it was broken near the hilt. His horn, cloven in two, was at his side. Many orcs lay slain, piled all about him and at his feet. Aragorn knelt beside him. Boromir opened his eyes and strove to speak. At last, slow words came. I tried to take the ring from Frodo, he said. I'm sorry. I have paid. His glance strayed to his fallen enemies. Twenty at least lay there. They have gone, halflings. <laughs> Orcs have taken them. I think they are not dead. Orcs bound them. <sighs> he paused and his eyes closed warily. After a moment he spoke again. <sighs> Farewell, Eric. <laughs> Go to me, Nastirith. And save my people. I have failed. No, said Aragorn, taking his hand and kissing his brow. You have conquered. Few have gained such a victory. Be at peace. Minas Tirith shall not fall. Boromir smiled. Which way did they go? Was Frodo there? said Aragorn. But Boromir did not speak again. <sighs> Alas, said Aragorn. Thus passes the heir of Denethor, 
Lord of the Tower of Guard. <sighs> this is a bitter end. Now the company is all in ruin. <laughs> it is I that have failed. Vain was Trendolf's trust in me. What shall I do now? Boromir has laid it on me to go to Minas Tirith, and my heart desires it. But where are the ring and the bearer? How shall I find them and save the quest from disaster? He knelt for a while, bent with weeping, still clasping Boromir's hand. So it was that Legolas and Gimli found him. They came from the western slopes of the hill, silently, creeping through the trees as if they were hunting. Gimli had his axe in hand, and Legolas his long knife. All his arrows were spent. When they came into the glade, they halted in amazement, and then they stood a moment with heads bowed in grief. For it seemed to them plain what had happened. Said Legolas, coming to Aragorn's side. slain many orcs in the woods, but we should have been of more use here. We came when we heard the horn. But too late, it seems. I fear you have taken deadly hurt. <sighs> Boromir is dead, answered Aragorn wearily. Before he died, Boromir told me that the orcs had bound them. He did not think that they were dead. I sent him to follow Merry and Pippin, but I did not ask him if Frodo and Sam were with him. Not until it was too late. All that I have done today has gone amiss. What is to be done now? First we must tend the fallen, said Legolas. We cannot leave them lying like carrion among these foul orcs, said Gimli. They are living prisoners. But we do not know whether the ring bearer is with them or not, said Aragorn. Are we to abandon him? Must we not seek him first? An evil choice is now before us. Then let us do first what we must do, said Legolas. We have not the time or the tools to bury our comrade fitly, or to raise a mound over him, a cairn we might build. The labor would be hard and long. There are no stones that we could use nearer than the waterside, said Gimli. Then let us lay him in a boat with his weapons, and the weapons of his vanquished foes, said Aragorn. We will send him to the falls of Rauros, and give him to Anduin. The river of Gondor will take care at least that no evil creature dishonors his bones. Quickly they searched the bodies of the orcs, gathering their swords and cloven helms and shields into a heap. Cried Aragorn. He picked out from the pile of grim weapons two knives, leaf-bladed, damasked in gold and red, and searching further, he found also the sheaths, black, set with small green gems. No orc tools are these, he said. They were born by the hobbits. Doubtless these orcs despoiled them, but feared to keep the knives, knowing them what they are. Work of westerness, wound about with spells of the bane of Mordor. Well, now if they still live, our friends are weaponless. I will take these things, hoping against hope, to give them back. And I, said Legolas, will take all the arrows that I can find, for my quiver is empty. He searched in the pile and on the ground about, and found not a few that were undamaged, and longer in the shaft than such arrows as the orcs were accustomed to use. He looked at them closely, and Aragorn looked on the slayer, and he said, Know anything of orcs and their kinds? Their cure is not after the manner of orcs at all. There were four goblin soldiers of greater stature, swart, slant-eyed, with thick legs and large hands. They were armed with short, broad-bladed swords, not with the curved scimitars usual with orcs, and they had bows of yew, in length and shape like the bows of men. Upon their shields they bore a strange device, a small white hand in the center of a black field. 
On the front of their iron helms was set an S rune, wrought of some white metal. I have not seen these tokens before, said Aragorn. What do they mean? Said Gimli. That is easy to read, said Legolas. Sharon does not use the elf runes. Neither does he use his right name nor permit it to be spelt or spoken, said Aragorn. And he does not use white. The orcs in the service of Barad-dur use the sign of the red eye. He stood for a moment and thought. This is for Saruman, I guess, he said at length. There is evil afoot in Isengard, and the West is no longer safe. It is as Gandalf feared. By some means the traitor Saruman has had news of our journey. It is likely, too, that he knows of Gandalf's fall. Pursuers from Moria may have escaped the vigilance of Lorien, or they may have avoided that land and come to Isengard by other paths. Orcs travel fast, but Saruman has many ways of learning news. Do you remember the birds? Said Gimli. Let us bear Boromir away. But after that we must guess the riddles, if we are to choose our course rightly, answered Aragorn. Maybe there is no right choice. Taking his axe, the dwarf now cut several branches. These they lashed together with bowstrings, and spread their cloaks upon the frame. Upon this rough bier, they carried the body of their companion to the shore, together with such trophies of his last battle as they chose to send forth with him. It was only a short way, yet they found it no easy task, for Boromir was a man both tall and strong. At the waterside, Aragorn remained, watching the bier, while Legolas and Gimli hastened back on foot to Path Garland. It was a mile or more, and it was some time before they came back paddling two boats swiftly along the shore. There is a strange tale to tell, said Legolas. There are only two boats upon the bank. We could find no trace of the other. Have orcs been here? asked Aragorn. We saw no signs of them, answered Gimli. I will look at the ground when we come there, said Aragorn. Now they laid Boromir in the middle of the boat that was to bear him away. The grey hood and elven cloak they folded and placed beneath his head. They combed his long dark hair and arrayed it upon his shoulders. The golden belt of Lorien gleamed about his waist. His helm they set beside him, and across his lap they laid the cloven horn and the hilts and shards of his sword. Beneath his feet they put the swords of his enemies. Then, fastening the prow to the stern of the other boat, they drew him out into the water. They rowed sadly along the shore, and turning into the swift-running channel, they passed the green sward of Path Galen. The steep sides of Tolbrandir were glowing. It was now mid-afternoon. As they went south, the fume of Rauros rose and shimmered before them, a haze of gold. The rush and thunder of the falls shook the windless air. Sorrowfully, they cast loose the funeral boat. There Boromir lay, restful, peaceful, gliding upon the bosom of the flowing water. The stream took him while they held their own boat back with their paddles. He floated by them, and slowly his boat departed, waning to a dark spot against the golden light. And then suddenly it vanished. Rauros roared on unchanging. The river had taken Boromir, son of Derethor, and he was not seen again in Minas Tirith, standing as he used to stand upon the White Tower in the morning. But in Gondor, in after days, it long was said that the elven boat rode the falls in the foaming pool and bore him down through Osgiliath, and past the many mouths of Anduin, out into the great sea, at night, under the stars. For a while the three companions remained silent, gazing after him. Then Aragorn spoke. They will look to him from the White Tower, he said. But he will not return from the mountain, from the sea. 
Then slowly he began to sing. The Rohan, the fen and field where the long grass grows. The west wind comes walking and about the walls it goes. What news from the west, O wandering wind, do you bring to me tonight? Have you seen Boromir the tall, by moon or by starlight? I saw him ride over seven streams, over waters wide and red. I saw him walking in empty lands until he passed away. Into the shadows of the north I saw him then no more. The north wind may have heard the horn of the son of Denethor. O oh, Boromir, from the high walls westward I looked afar, but you came not from the empty lands where no men are. Then Legolas sang. From the mouths of the sea the south wind flies, from the sand hills and the stones, the wailing of the gulls it bears, and the gate it moans. What news from the south, O oh, sighing wind, do you bring to me at eve? Where now is Boromir the fair? He tarries, and I grieve. Ask not of me where he doth dwell, so many bones there lie. On the white shores, in the dark shores, under the stormy sky, so many have passed down Anduin to find the flowing sea. Ask the north wind, news of them the north wind sends to me. O oh, Boromir, beyond the gate the seaward road runs south. But you came not with the wailing gulls from the grey sea's mouth. Then Aragorn sang again. From the gate of kings the north wind rides, and past the roaring falls. And clear and cold about the tower its loud horn calls. What news from the north, O mighty wind, do you bring to me today? What news of Boromir the bold? For he is long away. Beneath Amon Hen I heard his cry. There many foes he fought, his cloven shield, his broken sword, they to the water brought. His head so proud, his face so fair, his limbs they laid to rest, and Rauros, golden Rauros falls, bore him upon its breast. O oh, Boromir, the tower of guard shall ever northward gaze, to Rauros, golden Rauros falls until the end of day. So they ended. Then they turned their boat and drove it with all the speed they could against the stream back to Path Garland. You left the east wind to me, said Gimli, but I will say no to you. <sighs> that is as it should be, said Aragorn. In Minas Tirith they endure the east wind, but they do not ask it for tidings. But now Boromir has taken his road, and we must haste to choose our own. They surveyed the green lawn quickly but thoroughly, stooping often to the earth. No orcs have been here on this ground, he said. Otherwise nothing can be made out for certain. All our footprints are here, crossing and recrossing. I cannot tell whether any of the hobbits have come back since the search for Frodo began. He returned to the bank, close to where the rill from the spring trickled out into the river. There are some clear prints here, he said. A hobbit waded into the water and back, but I cannot say how long ago. How then do you know this riddle? asked Gimli. Aragorn did not answer at once, but went back to the camping place and looked at the baggage. Two packs are missing, he said, and one is certainly Sam's. It was rather large and heavy. This then is the answer. Frodo has gone by boat. And his servant has gone with him. Frodo must have returned while we were all away. I met Sam going up the hill and told him to follow me, but plainly he did not do so. He guessed his master's mind, and came back here before Frodo had gone. He did not find it easy to leave Sam behind. But why should he leave us behind and without a word? said Gimli. That was a strange deed. And a brave deed, said Aragorn. Sam was right, I think. Frodo did not wish to lead any friend to death with him in Mordor. But he knew that he must go himself. Something happened after he left us that overcame his fear and doubt. 
Maybe hunting orcs came on him and he fled, said Legolas. He fled, certainly, said Aragorn. But not, I think, from orcs. What he thought was the cause of Frodo's sudden resolve and flight, Aragorn did not say. The last words of Boromir he kept long secret. Well, so much is at least now clear, said Legolas. Frodo is no longer on this side of the river. He can only have taken the boat, and Sam is with him. Only he would have taken his pack. Our choice, then, said Gimli, is either to take the remaining boat and follow Frodo, or else to follow the orcs on foot. There is little hope either way. We have already lost precious hours. Let me think, said Aragorn. And now may I make a right choice and change the evil fate of this unhappy day. He stood silent for a moment. I will follow the orcs, he said at last. I would have guided Frodo to Mordor and gone with him to the end. But if I seek him now in the wilderness, I must abandon the captives to torment and death. My heart speaks clearly at last. The fate of the bearer is in my hands no longer. The company has played its part. Yet we that remain cannot forsake our companions while we have strength left. Come! We will go now. Leave all that can be spared behind. We will press on by day and dark. They drew up the last boat and carried it to the trees. They laid it beneath such of their goods as they did not need, and could not carry away. Then they left Path Galen. The afternoon was fading as they came back to the glade where Boromir had fallen. Then they picked up the trail of the orcs. It needed little skill to find. No other folk make such a trampling, said Legolas. It seems their delight to slash and beat down growing things that are not even in their way. They go with a great speed for all that, said Aragorn. But they do not tire, and later we may have to search for our path in hard bare lands. Well, after them, said Gimli. Orcs too can go swiftly, and they do not tire sooner than orcs. But it will be a long chase, and they have a long start. Yes, said Aragorn. We shall all need the endurance of dwarves. But come, with hope or without hope, we will follow the trail of our enemies. And woe to them if we prove the swifter. We will make such a chase that shall be accounted a marvel among the three kindreds, elves, dwarves, and men. Forth! The three hunters! Like a deer, he sprang away. Through the trees he sped. On and on he led them, tireless and swift, now that his mind was at last made up. The woods about the lake they left behind. Long slopes they climbed, dark, hard-edged against the sky, already red with sunset. Dusk came. They passed away, grey shadows in a stony land. Dusk deepened. Mist lay behind them among the trees below and brooded on the pale margins of the Anduin. But the sky was clear. Stars came out. The waxing moon was riding in the west, and the shadows of the rocks were black. They had come to the feet of stony hills, and their pace was slower, for the trail was no longer easy to follow. Here the highlands of the Emmanuel ran from north to south in two long tumbled ridges. The western side of each ridge was steep and difficult, but the eastward slopes were gentler, furrowed with many gullies and narrow ravines. All night, the three companions scrambled in this bony land, climbing to the crest of the first and tallest ridge, and down again into the darkness of a deep winding valley on the other side. There, in the still cool hour before dawn, they rested for a brief space. The moon had long gone before them. The stars glittered above them, the first light of day had not yet come over the dark hills behind. 
For the moment, Aragorn was at a loss. The orc trail has descended into the valley, but there it had vanished. Which way would they turn, do you think? Said Legolas. Northward to take a straighter road to Isengard or Fangorn, if that is their aim, as you guess. Or southward to strike the Entmosh. They will not make for the river whatever mark they aim at, said Aragorn. And unless there is much amiss in Rohan and the power of Saruman is greatly increased, they will take the shortest way that they can find over the fields of the Rohirrim. The dale ran like a stony trough between the ridged hills, and a trickling stream flowed among the boulders at the bottom. A cliff frowned upon their right. To their left rose grey slopes, dim and shadowy in the late night. They went for a mile or more northwards. Aragorn was searching, bent towards the grounds among the folds and gullies leading up into the western ridge. Legolas was some way ahead. Suddenly, the elf gave a cry, and the others came running towards him. We have already overtaken some of those that we are hunting, he said. Look! He pointed, and they saw that what they had at first taken to be boulders lying at the foot of the slope were huddled bodies. Five dead orcs lay there. They had been hewn with many cruel strokes, and two had been beheaded. The ground was wet with their dark blood. Ah, oh, here is another riddle, said Gimli. But it needs the light of day, and for that we cannot wait. Yet, however you read it, it seems not unhopeful, said Legolas. Enemies of the orcs are likely to be our friends. Do any folk dwell in these hills? No, said Aragorn. The Rohirrim seldom come here, and it is far from Minas Tirith. It might be that some company of men were hunting here for reasons that we do not know, yet I think not. What do you think? said Gimli. I think that the enemy brought his own enemy with him, answered Aragorn. These are northern orcs from far away. Among the slain there are none of the great orcs with the strange badges. There was a quarrel, I guess. It is no uncommon thing with these foul folk. Maybe there was some dispute about the road. Said Gimli. Let us hope that they too did not meet their end here. Aragorn searched the ground in a wide circle, but no other traces of the fight could be found. They went on. Already the eastward sky was turning pale, the stars were fading, and a grey light was slowly growing. A little further north they came to a fold in which a tiny stream, falling and winding, had cut a stony path down into the valley. In it some bushes grew, and there were patches of grass upon its sides. At last, said Aragorn, here are the tracks that we seek, up this water channel. This is the way that the orcs went after their debate. Swiftly now the pursuers turned and followed the new path, as if fresh from a night's rest.